Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is Tri-Cities Community Television. Before we get started with today's interview, I just want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Quiquitlam First Nations. And we thank the Quiquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to protect the lands and the waters and all that lie above and below. So today we're joined by John Saramba, and John is a, a very well-known and well-respected um, conservationist and environmentalist, and he is also a member of uh, Burke Mountain Naturalists. John is involved in uh, many, many um, environmental projects within the Tri-Cities, but today we're going to talk mostly about his passion and his knowledge for the local bat populations within the Tri-Cities and his efforts to protect those uh, populations. So thank you so much for joining us today, John. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, I, any chance I have to talk about one of my favorite subjects, that's wildlife conservation, particularly bats, I look forward to it and thank you for the opportunity. Well, we're really happy to have you here today and to learn more about bats. Um, maybe we could start with some, just some basic information. Can you tell us what kind of bats we have locally and maybe a little bit about where we can find them? Uh, certainly. We in British Columbia, we have between 16 and 17 bats, depending on whether you count uh, incidental or accidental sightings that haven't been confirmed. And of those, we have 10 to 11 within the local region. That's something that people don't realize, just how diverse a population we have. Some of the more common ones that I and others have identified are little brown myotis, yuma myotis, uh, big brown bats, hoary bats, silver-haired bats, and then some of the less common bats are long-legged and long-eared myotis. Uh, we have a rare colony at Minicata of towns and big-eared bats otherwise known as Mickey Mouse because of the size of their oh. ears. And it's, it's safe to say that uh, you can just about find bats anywhere in the Tri-Cities if you know where to look. And most people, when they go out at night, they just assume what they see flying is, are birds. And mm -hmm. it's not actually birds, it's the night shift. The bats take over. So okay. if you're going looking for bats, there's several really good recommendations I have. The first and one of the best ways to see bats up close safely without disturbing them is to participate in a local bat monitoring group. And we have several in the Tri-Cities that go out and count bats at known roosts for at least four times during the summer. So it's a great way to see a large number of bats flying out and to learn about bats. Another way you can see bats is to go to known foraging areas. And we have several particular species of bats that are known to go after aquatic flying insects. And two of the best places to go see them, uh, once again safely without disturbing them because they have observation platforms, are at Como Lake and at Lake Burn Lagoons. Mm. Oh, so very local, mm. easily accessible Easi places. Easily, and it's mm. one of the most enjoyable nature experiences at night that I've had the pleasure of myself seeing, but I really have a passion for taking others out to go and watch the bats. And it's like a ballet. We sit on a fishing dock out at Como Lake, we get the camping chairs out, we relax, and about 15 minutes after sunset, here come the bats, anywhere from 50 to 100 bats. And these bats are well known for going after aquatic flying insects. So they fly about one foot above the water and they circle around herding the insects towards the shore. So the insects have to rise up, they get concentrated, and the bats can catch them easier. So you can watch about 15 minutes after sunset is when they come out for the first time. And they stay for about 45 minutes until they've had their fill, and then they rest and either return to their roost or go to their second favorite restaurant or foraging area. It sounds like a fascinating experience. And is this all year round or do the bats migrate? We or? have actually, we have what we call short term and long, uh, short distance, long distance migration. Most of our bats, uh, when, they've, when the females particularly have finished rearing, they're young and the young can fly and they know how, how to forage and where to forage. 
the uh, ladies then leave, and they, it's the only time of the year they get together with the men. The ladies do all the oh, work in raising. Well, of the course. Uh, uh, <laughs> the men are out golfing, watching yeah, big screen fun. TVs. Yeah, having fun. <laughs> hanging out in their ha roofs. Hanging out like they normally do, <laughs> yes. They, they're not allowed. In fact, you rarely find any uh, major colonies with men in male bats, okay. adult male bats. It's ladies only. And so they go and they uh, meet in a swarming process and they mate and they fatten up as much as they can. And they usually start uh, leaving their uh, maternity roost, the females, in August, late August. Okay. And then they hibernate, the ones that are short distance migrators, hibernate in caves or abandoned mines, on, uh, starting in about October till March. Then in March they come out and they slowly make their way back to their maternity colony. They have very high fidelity to their maternity colony. So they will go back to the same place so year after year. So kind of like salmon spawning and coming back home. Very much so. Okay. Now about 13 or 14 of our bat species stay in British Columbia, we believe. There's three species that are known to migrate long distance and they can fly as easily as far as birds. So they go to the southern US, Mexico and Central America in the same time period, October, and then they come back in March. Okay, I just have a quick question, just out of sure. curiosity. When they migrate, do they migrate at night? Yes. Okay, so um, another question I have is for the maternity roosts, where are those? Are those man-made roosts that they're using in an urban environment, or are they natural barns and trees and things like that, or do we even know? We we have some sense, and it's a two-part question. One of the problems in the bat field is there are very few bat researchers, bat biologists, compared to other wildlife biologists. There's even less funding for bats than for other wildlife species. Okay. And so we still have a lot to learn about bats, and one of the real problems in management of bats is we have so little information about their population trends, population dynamics. Right. But what we do know is that there are four to five species of bats that tend to, I call them colonizing bats. They tend to like larger groups. They go for structures or natural features that can hold 20 up to 4,000 bats. And those are usually wow. buildings. They've gotten used to uh, being in buildings. Like an abandoned barn? Abandoned or? barn. There's a high infinity for, I found, uh, quite a few bats at horse stables. Partly because maybe the manure attracts flying insects ah. and the wood. It's usually cedar wood or uh, other types of wood products and bats have a high affinity for wood, maybe sensing that they used to colonize in trees. So those are the four or five. Now the other species of bats, plus the males, rely primarily on natural features, including trees, foliage, uh, rock crevices. There's a lot of bats mm. that go in the rock crevices in the Okanagan because they're sheltered and it gives them warmth during the day and also at night because the rock absorbs the heat and releases it more slowly. So part of the challenge with managing bats is unlike a lot of other species, they have varying habitat, varying food, and varying thermal regulation in terms of the energy they use during the year, which greatly varies depending whether they're male or female. Okay, so I, you just brought up a ton of questions for me. <laughs> um, but maybe we can start with, what's the difference between the male and, and the female with the thermal regulation? Like, why do they differ? Well, the male has the ability during the year to go into a, a semi-state of hibernation called torpor right? and so they can conserve energy. It takes an incredible amount of energy to fly for a bat and the bat by the way is the only mammal that has true flight. Some people say well what about flying squirrels? Right. But they glide. They, but they not sustained Not flight. sustained. Yeah. But in order to sustain their flight and the only way that they, the primary way they navigate is through echolocation. So they're actually calling projecting a sound every time they have a wing beat for efficiency and that takes an incredible amount of energy oh. because it's at 110 decibels which is the equivalent of a jet engine wow. for this little creature and it's calling 
when it's forage, when it's just uh, cruising and navigating its form a three-dimensional map, it calls two to ten times a second. When it's hunting and it's it's bearing down on insect, that increases anywhere from 50 to 100 calls per second, and each time it's yelling at the top of its lungs. Mm -hmm. And the only way that it keeps from deafening itself, because the call is so loud, has muscles in its middle ear that contract and close oh, wow. as it calls. The sound so goes out, the echo comes back, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then it actually memorizes a three-dimensional map based on its calls, and that's how it can navigate and hunt for insects. Well, that takes so much energy right. that it has to eat every night at least a male, 50% of its body weight. Okay, so... Um, and so they're able to rest and they can cool their body down. It doesn't take as much calories, then they can conserve their calories. For a female, and if it happens to get colder at night, which it does, mm -hmm. especially in the spring, they don't have to worry because a bat, one of the other unique features, unlike many other mammals, they can lower their core temperature in a cave from 37 degrees normal to ambient, which is four degrees. They're not cold-blooded, but they can lower their body, body temperature, temperature to without ambient without, okay. and that's why they can live so long. And that's part. torpor. Uh, that's uh, full hibernation. Full hibernation. But okay. so they go into a torpor during the spring. They conserve that energy. A female is pregnant. Mm -hmm. She can't get too cold, otherwise oh, it's okay, it, right increases gestation period. Slow down. Slow down the growth, possibly jeopardize the growth. And then when she has the pup, she has to have enough temperature to produce milk. Right. And enough water to produce milk. So she has to make sure that her temperature stays high. So she doesn't have the luxury of going into torpor like the male. So her requirements are that she has to eat her body weight in flying insects every night. So not only does she have more work to do, raising the pups, we call them pups. Pups, yes. She also has to eat more in order to do that. In order to do mm. that, and also she has to sometimes, when they're quite young, uh, the pup attaches to her and goes out and she takes it foraging. So that's an incredible burden on her. And even trying to fly when she's pregnant, it's a third of her body weight that right. she's carrying. The pup has only got such a limited time to grow before it has to be fully ready to fly that it's born at an advanced stage. So it's the equivalent if uh, a, an adult female woman had a 60 pound baby. Oh, so when the pup okay. is born, it's that big. <laughs> wow. Oh, uh, yeah, that's quite daunting. Um, so when she takes them out with her, why, why would they go out with her? You said sometimes they'll attach and go out yes, foraging together. Yes, for security. So that she's worried about them staying alone? Oh, yes, and falling okay. out, of the, out of the nest and predators. Okay. And especially when they're young, even when they're, they're born, their claws are incredibly strong. Their legs are weak, but their claws are strong. So they can attach to her and uh, she can carry them along. So it's just a maternal instinct. But then once they get a little bigger, they're too big to carry. So, so she leaves what them kind behind. of predators is she worried about? Like what would go All after sorts of predators. Uh, one of the biggest uh, predators is fila uh, feral cats. Can easily climb up into a roost or right. a bat box if it's not protected. Uh, mink, weasel. Mm. We've had, uh, we've interrupted an owl trying to get bats. We've been monitoring and there's been an owl squawking at us twice when we were monitoring. Waiting Was that for us locally? To leave. Yes, at Colony yeah. Farm and at Minicata. In fact, at Minicata we happened to see a swarm of bats flying out and an owl flew right through the middle of them trying to, to capture the bats. Mm -hmm. uh, other parts of the uh, country, snakes are a predator there, skunks, crows, uh, sometimes you have the unfortunate situation where it gets so crowded in a bat box that uh, a pup will drop to the ground if it's in a weakened state. As soon as it hits the ground, it's very difficult for a bat to actually oh, pick right. up the yes. baby. It doesn't have hands. And so it's fair game for any crow. I've seen crows in this, sitting on top of bat boxes just waiting. So you, we have predators that are an issue. Yes. Um, and bats eat insects, yes. so are pesticides a concern? Dramatic concern for two reasons. One is that bats are eating the insects that are coated with the pesticide. 
The other is the more pesticides you use, the less insects or food sources for the bats. So you've got a double... Double yeah. whammy. And what we're trying to do, which is I see a positive benefit to bats. Bats are the largest nocturnal predator of flying insects. So farmers now are realizing that it's to their advantage to have bats in their area because they have provided biological service. Right, in a fact, little biological control. Yes, in fact, oh. the estimate is between three to five billion dollars in the United States are saved wow. every year in reduced pesticide costs with the bat population. So are they indiscriminate insect eaters or do they have certain insects that they go after? Well, I always think of them eating like their body weight or half their body weight in mosquitoes, but I'm sure they're not exclusive mosquitoes. That's a very eaters. good question. And once again, uh, bats have different sizes and they have different frequencies when they echolocate. And that's how we can tell differentiate species is by the frequency of their calls. We can use a bat detector to look at a database and say, okay, this frequency is generally associated with this size bat and this species of bat. The larger the bat, the larger the insect they typically go after. Oh, okay. They have a preference, the little brown myotis and the ewa myotis, which are our most common bat, the ones we usually find in bat boxes. They generally go after mid-sized insects. And contrary to belief, uh, a mosquito is not their preferred diet, but they always use, well, they can capture 600 mosquitoes. The reason they do that is when they did the research, they, the easiest insect to get was mosquitoes, and they put a tent full of mosquitoes and a bat in there. And oh, okay, so the research is yes, that's, <laughs> needs that's, a little fine-tuning. Exactly. Right. Bats actually prefer, um, depending on the size bat, moss, because there's a there's lot more, more meat. Yeah, exactly, it's yeah. a little more sustenance There's some sustenance wonderful there. videos on how uh, bats capture moss. Mm. They capture it two ways, but the main way is on wing. So they actually, as they're flying, they capture the moth, pull it into its wing, put it in towards its mouth, chews off the wings because there's no meat on the wings, and then the spits them out, and then moth is eats the moth. Seven seconds, it's ready for the next one. Wow. They're incredibly efficient. Wow. Uh, they eat, as you were mentioning, they eat roughly, depending on where you are in North America, up to two to 250 different uh, species of insects. We have a bat that uh, not only eats insects, but they also eat spiders. Mm -hmm. And we have one species of bat in the Okanagan, but that uh, it's one of the few bats that can land on the ground, and it will eat scorpions. It will, de it will put up with the scorpion stinging it, will eat it, and it has enough power, it's one of the few bats, to actually lift off the ground. Wow, so bats are fascinating and diverse. Like we seem to, um, you know, they, they play a role in the, um, they have a niche in the ecological sort of um, system. Is there any other roles that they play? Absolutely. For one thing, people don't realize just how diverse the bat population is. Of the 5,000 species of mammals, mm -hmm. 1,400 are bats in the world. Really? Yes. We okay, I'm shocked. I, 1,400 I species of bats. Oh. Uh, of those, 70% eat insects. But the other 30% are fruit eating. They also are pollinators. And oh. in terms of regeneration of forests, the uh, fruit-eating bats do a, they're much more efficient than birds at regenerating forests because a, a flying fox, for example, with a three to four foot wingspan can right. carry a piece of fruit 30 kilometers before it eats it. And then it drops its seeds, where a bird has to eat the seeds in place and it drops them within a kilometer or so. I feel like bats seem to be greatly underappreciated. <laughs> Absolutely. The single biggest issue I deal with and many others is the negative perception about bats. Mm -hmm. Bats are blind. Bats will fly are in your hair. Are bats blind? No, they have really good eyesight. They, some of them see in black and white, but they can often, especially the ones migrating, will navigate by um, landforms. Oh, okay. And so they put their echolocation on pause because it takes a lot of energy. that would be too energy, energy yes. intensive and to migrate And there'll be a dusk that. and they can see mm -hmm. landforms. And uh, bats have, have pretty reasonable vision. And will they get caught in your hair? Uh, yes, they, they can. And people say, well, how is that possible? Two things. First of all, you're a insect-attracting 
species. Ah. Think about it. When you're walking, you're giving off you're carbon dioxide. You've got all those mosquitoes. You've got all those mosquitoes <laughs> buzzing around you. So a bat says, hey, there's easy prey around her. So they will fly. I've, uh, I've counted more than 20,000 bats in the last wow. five or six years. Never had one hit me. But they've come awfully close. So when we have, whenever I go with bot, bat monitors or when we do a, a watch bats foraging, if we're down close at their level, I tell people, don't move. They know where you are. Where they'll fly in your hair, it's not really in your hair, but they may hit you, is if a bat's flying this way, close to you, and all of a sudden you try to move out of the way, and then right. the bat... you catch them off guard. So it's, it's accidental. Wow. Bats are very shy creatures. They're incredibly small, much smaller than most people realize. Do we have another challenge that I know is out there, and I, I don't know how close we are to having it here right now, um, white nose syndrome? Huge challenge. It's probably the single most recorded deaths of animals in recent history. Over six million bats have died in the eastern United States and Canada, and they are actively doing research to the best of their ability to see how close white nose syndrome is advancing it has been now confirmed as close as Alberta and also Washington State. Wow. There was an incident where they jumped from halfway across the United States and all of a sudden they showed up in Washington State and they suspect it was human intervention because bats right. make the mistake of getting caught up in a power awning of an RV or getting in a hay truck and they go for a ride then they're released. Right. So we have uh, white nose syndrome within about 100 kilometers of where we are. And we're just really afraid of what it'll do because it'll destroy 95% of um, three or four main bat species. Right. Now, I know we were in the States a couple of years ago, and there's biosecurity is really high. When you go into caves where there's bats, you do the foot wash, and you yes. have to change your clothes and new, new clothes every day. You can't go into a, bat, a cave twice with the same clothes on. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're doing here um, locally, your work to protect the bat populations or to enhance bat populations? Uh, yes, certainly. I, I'm pretty fortunate that we've developed a quite comprehensive bat program and we've been able to leverage that in uh, creating partnerships with schools, several schools, with girl guides, with uh, scouting groups, with other nature clubs to try and educate them and have them develop their own bat program. We have developed a consistent uh, monitoring program through the BC Community Bat Program and so we do bat counts and I've had the pleasure of transitioning and training three other groups that have now taken on bat monitoring at our local uh, regional parks. Oh, okay. We also build bat boxes and help people install them uh, the other thing is I do a lot of bat presentations, but probably my, my most important um, activity is to take people out and actually experience these beautiful creatures, to actually let them mm -hmm. see the bats. Uh, I take them to the parks or uh, other places, and when they see a bat and they can appreciate just how uh, amazing these creatures are, uh, I think that we gain an ambassador, or at least I hope so. I do, and I know the work that you've done is an incredible amount of work, and um, you're kind of locally known as the bat guy because of all the, the knowledge that you hold there. Um, what's your prognosis? Like, what's the future of bats hold? Are we, are we going to be able to um, maintain our bat populations here, given, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, urbanization and the urban environment and the challenge that sort of brings for bats. Besides white nose syndrome and wind turbines, which is a huge threat for bats, the probably the single biggest threat, and, and I'm, I wish I could say, Nancy, I wish I could say that I was hopeful, mm. but I'm very concerned because the biggest threat to bats is the loss of habitat, both right. wetland and trees. And with the large areas in British Columbia, of uh, old growth and secondary growth trees that have been taken down, uh, we lose a tremendous amount of habitat, much more than we even realize. Right. And also, 
urban, uh, rapid urban development is being responsible for a dramatic reduction in, in bat habitat because people think that well, we just have to put up a few bat boxes. Well, as I said before, most of our bat species don't even live in bat boxes. Right. They live in the, the very trees and uh, snags, wildlife trees, as well as the uh, wetlands. That's the places that they eat. So the cleaner we can keep our water bodies, mm -hmm. the better we can deal with climate change, the better we can do with tree preservation. That's what I'm banking my hope on, is that we can, we can come, become aware more of just not for bats, but for other wildlife, just uh, the, the, what we're doing in terms of the harm and impact on these animals. Um, if people wanted to get more involved in a bat program or wanted to maybe go out on one of the bat walks that you talked about, is there a way that they can get in touch with you? Yes, uh, they can uh, contact Burke Mountain Naturalist, the general email, and ask for the bat team activities. Also, one of the best ways and the best sources of information is the BC Community Bat Program website. And there they can have, um, they can get in touch with the regional coordinator okay. for the bat program. And then they be can become a volunteer for the bat counts. And finally, they can call the municipality and they can request, uh, I heard there was a bat walk last year. Could we have another one this year? Because I've worked right. with municipalities on a volunteer basis to do bat walks. So there's at least three different ways. And one final tip is I was so pleased that uh, I and another individual worked with the Fraser Valley Regional Library and they have bat backpacks. I've heard about the bat packs. Yes, so yes. that you can take a book out on bats and you also have a, a, a bat detector that you can put on an iPhone or an Android device and you can take that out and then you can actually listen for the bats at a place like Lake Burn or Coma Lake. Okay, I think, I think it's worth taking just a couple more minutes to talk a little bit about the resources that you've brought here. So these bat packs, this is part of the bat pack, yes. and people can get that at their local library? Yeah, the Fraser Valley Regional Library, for example, in uh, Pitt Meadows or Maple Ridge or even here in Port Coquitlam, just with a library card, they can take it out for three weeks. And they have bird backpacks, but they also have bat Backpacks. Oh, excellent. And this is the most inexpensive uh, bat detector. And what this does is it just fits on to an iPhone or an Android device, depending on which one you get. And then you install the software, which is free. And then when you turn it on, what it will do is it will take ultrasonic sound translate into a sound you can hear. It will then, on here, show you the individual bat calls if the bat oh. comes within 5,200 feet. And it will also try to identify within the software database what type of bat it is. Interesting. So when I go out mm. to do a survey, I will run this, and I will run it the whole time I'm out for, I'm out for the survey. Then at the end, I will then look at the recordings, and each one of these is a recording of a bat. Oh, wow. And then it'll tell me what species. It'll give me a picture of a bat. And then I take a summary so I can tell how many bat calls. Not necessarily how many bats, because the right. same bat might be. You might be doing. listening to the same bat. Yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, it will then tell me how many bat calls I had. And then I can do a how many bat calls per minute and do a, a general comparison. And this is one of my favorite bats. It's our biggest bat, oh, a hoary wow. bat, and it's got it's just beautiful. Beautiful. It, it is. So you learn, you, you can listen, you can learn that the bats are out there, which types of bats yes. are out there, and then you can also learn a little bit about each species each through this species. bat pack. Exactly, mm. and uh, I don't know if it has this book, but uh, I was just gonna show you. And you can test this. And I usually do it just to make sure uh, moving your fingers produces oh, yes. ultrasonic sound. And this is a, a chart of the different frequencies. And as so I mentioned. What species was that? <laughs> uh, this was a John species, a clumsy John species. But if I played, for example, uh, a hoary bat, they are our biggest bat, they're our lowest frequency call. 
and they are highest flyer because they're like the commercial jumbo jet. Right. Long wings, but can't maneuver too well around the forest. They so don't want to get caught up in exactly. The... So they're after the high flying moss, and they right. come out first just before sunset. And those are the ones that you can usually see. And they have a low frequency call, like a dung dung dung. So this picks it up and then transfers the sound into a sound that you can then hear. That down there is the back yes. call. And that it's faint because it was some distance away. When it's louder, it's more dung, dung, dung. And then right. the small bats are a higher pitch. So you can start to identify even before you see what bat comes up as a species just by the sound here that you're hearing. And knowing where to look a little yes. bit and, and when And children, to look. When, I, mm. when I give this to them, you can put this on an iPad and then they can hear the bat and then they look up and they see it. Oh, oh my gosh, it's just magic. That sounds incredible. So I noticed, John, you've brought in a bat box. Um, I was wondering, can you tell us a little bit about the bat box, um, how it works, and, and where you would put one of these bat boxes? Certainly be my pleasure. Uh, this is what I used, and I'm always looking for ways to try and educate people and get them interested in bats. And I found that uh, showing pictures was one thing, but uh, because of the way bat boxes are built, mm -hmm. it's hard to know what's inside. Right. So what I've done is I, I'm uh, very blessed. I've got several volunteers that are really good wor woodworkers. So I come up with the ideas and I say, could you build this? And they come away and they, they build these fabulous products. So you design this yes. bat box? Oh, yes. Okay. And I specifically designed it so that you could take it apart. And I also designed it with a, a board, which I didn't bring, that I could put on a light stand and put it six feet in the air and make it simulate that it's a bat box mounted on a post. Right. And I could show the different features associated with the bat box because I'm a real proponent of uh, accessories as well. So with this bat box, I can take it completely apart. So one of the ways I can use it is to have it used as a puzzle for the children to put together. Oh, awesome. And then the other the other thing that I like to show people is that, oh. Oh, we lost a bat there. There's oh, yeah, a bat they, inside. There's, <laughs> and I actually have their heads poking out so the kids automatically <laughs> say, and this is probably close to the size of uh, some of our bat species. So They're, bats can get in really tiny, narrow places, three right? Three quarters of an inch. Wow. And that's how ours are constructed. And that also helps keep predators out. And, and the, warmth would and it have? And warmth, absolutely. In fact, colonizing bats love to be as close to one another because then they don't have to rely on their own heat. They can right. generate heat as a it's group. It's kind of like penguins. Yes. yes. And so uh, most of our bat boxes, once they become populated, they become very crowded. And I'll have a picture to share with you about that. Okay. But uh, one of the features of uh, bat boxes is a small version. They're usually uh, twice as wide this but they all have the same types of features uh, one of them is a nice landing strip here and you'll notice that there's scored lines here oh, I see those little ridges or and little those little lines, ridges yeah. are all that a bat needs to hang on to wow. and the reason is a bat's claws are rather unique and this is a close-up picture of their claws oh wow okay and so they can they can hang on to this quite comfortably so and the reason why we have a landing strip is when bats first learn to fly it's a lot like teenagers when or anyone first learning to drive they're not so proficient Getting shall we say end. yes <laughs> and i've actually seen bats sort of not quite make it in because they since they can't uh they can't fly straight in a bat actually has to go in a parabolic u-shape and fly up into here right and when they come out they're they spin 90, that's the other nice thing. Oh, so they spin thing. around when they're inside? They, they spin around and 95% of their time they spend hanging upside down. Could you imagine what would happen mm. to you if you were upside down for that period of time? So they have special blood vessels that allow enough blood to get to their brain but stop the rest from overwhelming them. So they are in here and the reason they can hang when they're completely asleep is their legs fold backwards to ours. So when they actually hang on, so do you mean their legs fold frontwards yes. or fold backwards? Oh, yes, okay. and so when they reach up, as they straighten their leg, their body weight, their claws clamp automatically. Oh, okay. 
So the only way they can release is they have to they have unhinge. To up, kind That's of. right, and then they release. So it's a safety mechanism. Exactly. They're not gonna so they can be completely asleep, mm. and they won't fall out even when they're they're young. So we have what's called chambers in here, and in this case, this is a three-chamber box. So there's two pieces of plywood here, and they're all scored, both sides. That's the hardest part of making a bat box is having the patience to oh. score these by hand. <laughs> but a very important. A very part. important. And so the reason we have three chambers, and some even have more, is that if it gets too hot at the front, the bats then can go towards the back of the box. So is the bat box not full then? Like, does it leave space for them to move around or? It does. Uh, and some bat boxes may only have 20 to 30 bats, but this box can easily hold 40 to 50 bats. And up here, this is a maternity box. You can see here that there's space up here. That's the attic. So when bats are young and they can't quite fly, if they want to follow their mum, they can just crawl down over into there without having to go outside the box and being exposed. Oh. It also has, uh, in addition to this, when we build them, uh, one thing I really am quite uh, firm about is the construction so that it's self-maintaining. Once you put out this bat box, it should last 10 to 12 years right. without having to maintain it, unlike a bird nest box. So do you make them out of cedar or yes. a specific? untreated cedar. Okay. And bats, uh, I found several houses and barns with cedar siding, and I've had a whole wall of a building at Widgeon Marsh Regional Park where the bats were roosting under the cedar siding because over the years the cedar siding had enough of a gap between a half inch to three quarters of an inch, the females could crawl under there and we had 300 bats. Could you imagine counting oh, wow. 300 bats flying out of a wall? Yeah, you need your bat counter. Or your <laughs> that, we actually have tally counters oh, do you? <laughs> and we have four to five people just on one oh. wall and then we take an average of that. Wow. Also, so this is, this is all cedar except the plywood here because we want fairly thin plywood. And the other nice thing is that cedar, we don't have to stain it. Uh, if you use plywood, then you have to stain or paint. Okay, and uh, maybe you don't want to stain the, with the They chemicals? actually now are changing the colors because they used to say, well, you want a bat box to be warm. So they used to say, paint them black in Canada. But then with climate change, right. we've had uh, deaths of bats from heat stroke. So now we're going to a lighter color. But with cedar, you don't have to worry about that. Right. It, and it holds up very well. Uh, the other thing that we do with our bat boxes is that we have a ventilation slot. So there's a, a slot here for air and a slot here. And then we put a reverse cut on here. So if it does rain, the water runs by oh, rather okay. than Okay, it doesn't go inside. in, it's going out. Exactly. Okay. Along with this, people say, well, if I put a bat box in my house or in a barn, I have to deal with the bat guano. The guano, I was gonna say a little bit of housekeeping. Yes, and that's where we came up with this invention. It's a like guano, a guano tray. tray. Ah. And so we put it on about six feet below the bat box and we attach it either to a post or to the side of the building. And I, the latest version, I'm always developing newer prototypes. You can take this off. And bat guano is one of the best uh, natural fertilizers. Right. So as long as you um, handle it in the open, and with disposable gloves, there's no danger to handling it. You can just take it directly and put it right on your garden. Excellent. Um, and I have a feeling that we'll talk more later yes. about maybe research, and I don't know if those guano trays have, play a role in your research, but- They do. We'll, we'll talk more about that. And one final thing, our biggest bat boxes in the air, in the region are at Colony Farm, there's seven chamber bat boxes, and we've had up to 500 bats in one bat box. Wow. And this is a picture looking up in the bat looking box. Looking underneath. You're up. looking straight up. This is the bottom of the box. So there are bats there's all the way up the box. There's a lot of bats in there. So they are in rows. It takes about okay. 40 minutes for them all to fly out because you have to have the first row fly, then the right. others crawl down, they fly kind of like getting out of a plane or something. Exactly, and because it's such a large colony, we have five bat boxes there. Uh, 
uh, the next time if I get a chance to speak again, I can talk about this groundbreaking research we have for developing a uh, probiotic partial immunization against bats with white nose syndrome. And Colony Farm is one of the test sites for the research project. Well, we will look forward in that case to having you come back and talking about that because um, again, I think it would be of great interest to a lot of people to hear that and, and help to get us all a little more educated on the subject of bats. Certainly. Um, and I know that you're involved in so many projects, but um, definitely we would love to have you come back and talk about the research component and the research side of the, the bat work that you do, um, as well as some of your other projects. So I think Certainly. like we have, I feel like we have a lot still to talk about. So I'd like to thank you so much for coming in and joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Okay, thank you for joining us. We've been talking to John Saramba, and he's been sharing with us some of his knowledge about bats and local bat populations. Thank you.